By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 109, and it features Lon McCarran, who is uh, half of the longtime World Series of Poker broadcast team for ESPN. Uh, Lon first started covering the WSP main event back in 2002 with Gabe Kaplan, and then began working with Norman Chad a year later when Chris Moneymaker won the tournament and helped to spark the poker boom. The duo's commentary has become so popular in the poker world that last year they were both jointly nominated for the Poker Hall of Fame, ultimately finishing with 20 votes from the panel of members. But Lon never intended to get so deep into the poker world, and in fact he almost turned down the job as he had been considering leaving broadcasting entirely to work a more traditional day job. Fortunately for us, he decided to give it a shot and the rest is history. But poker is not all we are going to discuss on this podcast. Lon had a very very diverse career in sports commentary before poker, which included working the Tour de France, uh, the X Games, MMA fighting, skiing, fishing, bowling, Scrabble, and even snow shovel racing, which I'm not even sure what that is. And honestly, that's only part of the list. On this episode, you'll also hear stories about his time covering uh, Major League Baseball's World Series during an earthquake, or his interviews with uh, legends like Wayne Gretzky and Muhammad Ali, and the time he was denied a favor by Roy Disney. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here is my conversation with Lon McCarran. I am here with the one and only Lon McCarran. Lon, how you doing? I'm doing great. Nice to connect with you finally, Julio. Yeah, I know. We just had Norman on, and then uh, you know I wanted to get the other half of the Hall of Fame nominees. nominees <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that was that was fun. I heard your interview with Norman. It was. Uh, one of the best I've heard. You do your homework, and so <laughs> I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't stay away. I appreciate that. And he was right, you know, that we we did uh, cut in line ahead of a lot of people to be a nominee, and and Matt Savage is one of them, as he mentioned. Well, I will get to that, uh, you know, and all your opinions about the Hall of Fame a little later. First, I want to get back to the beginning uh, because you were born in Memphis. Yeah, <laughs> For you know, I, I always pictured you as a California kid. You know, well. I am. It's only a technicality uh, that, you know, I have Tennessee in my background. I'm the youngest of, of four kids. Uh, my dad was in radio and television back in the South. Uh, and oh, the so a family business. It is a family business because my older brother uh, as well. And um, I was 18 months old and the family picked up after my dad got a job in San Francisco radio and moved to California. So uh, like most California quote unquote natives, I was not born in California. <laughs> so what did, what did dad specialize in? Was he also sports broadcasting? No, he was in news. Most by, uh, my dad and my brother were both in news. I remember listening, uh, to my dad do the evening newscasts on, uh, the local radio station KFRC in San Francisco before it went, uh, top 40 in the sixties. Uh, they were a news station, and so I would listen to him as I was going to bed, and uh, and then he eventually moved from radio to TV in San Francisco, became a, a producer and on-air guy for a lot of their weekend community affairs uh, shows, and then ended up running their radio station, FM radio station, for a long time, and uh, along the way, my brother had gone to school and worked for the college newspaper, and then got a journalism 
uh, master's at uh, Columbia University in New York and worked in San Francisco television forever. And I followed his footsteps. So I, I got to wonder, you're a kid, you know, seeing your dad on TV. Is, is your dad famous technically? I mean, is he getting spotted at the grocery store? Uh, no, his stuff was a lot of, uh, at that time, TV stations had a requirement to do public affairs programming, which is probably the most boring program you'll ever find on television, why they don't do it anymore. But they had a requirement to do a certain number of hours of locally produced uh, who's in our community type programming, which my dad reveled in. And so he would travel all around the Bay Area and find people and he would host a, a show, a one hour show uh, on the NBC affiliate in San Francisco every weekend. Uh, but then he hosted other stuff, too, uh, where I made my first TV appearance. He hosted a children's Christmas special uh, that I was on, and, and then I was on the <laughs> local Mayor Art children's show a couple of times in, in San Francisco. And um, it was a blast because that was back in the day when the uh, the Raiders were good, but the NFL still blacked out local NFL teams if they didn't sell out. And they never sold out. And so my dad would take me down <laughs> to the TV station in San Francisco, and I get to watch the NBC feed of the, the local Raider game at home when they weren't being broadcast at home. Uh, so it was, you know, little perks like that that a, a kid like me who loves sports and grew up as an athlete uh, loved to, you know, show off to the other kids. What was your role in the Christmas special? Oh, I uh, actually had, I did have a speaking role. Um, it was my first TV joke uh, where my <laughs> dad was mentioning um, something about being aware of, of Christmas and all it has. And he talks about, you know, your, he said your five senses. And then I pull out a nickel and hand it to him. And he says, no, no, not, not those five cents, Lon. And, and he goes on to talk <laughs> about it. I don't, I don't remember the rest of the gig, but uh, yeah, I was a setup man for his for his joke. <laughs> Perfect. So okay, so you go to UC Santa Barbara, uh, you know, to get that degree in broadcasting. <laughs> That's not a degree. Uh, no, it, uh, was, it was communications. It was communications. communications. It was the closest thing they had. I was bound and determined to go to Santa Barbara. My brother had gone there ahead of me, um, and it's like you see Santa Barbara and you see coastline when you're sitting in a classroom it's like how can he not go and so i ended up in santa barbara uh junior college there first and then on to the university when it was easy to go from a junior college university with my grades and uh, <laughs> i took the close i knew i at that point i had uh dreams of being a baseball player i did finish my baseball career at the junior college in santa barbara playing with uh one a uh, guy whose jersey I saw in the Baseball Hall of Fame last year, Jesse Orozco, uh, relief pitcher. Oh, cool. Extraordinaire. So he was on my team in Santa Barbara. And uh, and then a, nobody else. What position else, did you play? Uh, the, I, I moved around. I played first base a lot. I pitched in, in high school when there was some interest from Baltimore Orioles in me. But nobody really wanted to draft me. And so I knew my career was over. And I decided to go to broadcasting. And uh, when I transferred to the university in Santa Barbara, they were already, you know, all the way through their year and they were playing above my head. So I wasn't going to be a member of their baseball team and, uh, knew I wanted to get into broadcasting. So I worked at the radio station. I took all the broadcasting courses, uh, that I could, and that was all part of their communications major. And so I worked at the radio station and the news and sports, and then jumped right into local Santa Barbara commercial radio when I graduated. Uh, we're gonna get to all your crazy gigs over the years. Oh, but nice. What did you What did you want to do at that time? What was like if you could have, pick, take your pick? I'm one of the rare ones. Um, I picked sportscasting uh, in college and stuck to it through thick and thin, and that's really what I wanted to do. I I felt I had a a knack for it. I had an eye for it. I had a feel for the broadcasting nuts and bolts side of it. I was good technically um, with edit machines and a feel for what I thought was compelling. Um, and, and I I was a good interviewer. I was a good writer in that sense, in that world. I felt, you know, I, I could hold my own. And um, I just had a natural feel for it, I think. And so I 
really had my eye on the prize of being a sportscaster. My goal was always to cover uh, skiing in Austria. And I got close, but I didn't get to do that. But I've, I've done a lot of great stuff and, and uh, don't regret anything. Skiing in Austria, really? Yeah, I did get, I was a, a, an ESPN host for World Cup skiing one year, but just before we were going to make the jump from the U.S. World Cup events over to Europe, uh, the company who had hired me said, you're not going, we're hiring Michelle Tafoya instead. And, of course, you, know, <laughs> you know, big time now. And I was really upset because I thought this is my chance, you know, all the whole time. Is that I want to cover skiing in Austria. That just seemed like, you know, a romantic kind of thing to do in the sports casting world. So I was a little upset. Michelle Tafoya took my spot on the World Cup uh, <laughs> circuit with uh, ESPN. And there was a little schadenfreude because I heard she first got off the bus in Europe, fell and broke her arm. So I thought, oh, hmm, man, I wonder uh, if that is that my doing or, or, or what. But she seems to have covered quite nicely. Recovery you, point, nice. you would have broke both arms, so she yeah, exactly. For you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta wonder, you know, with uh, broadcasting or sports casting, it's it's got to be about uh, the perks of the gig, right? You know, you get a nice trip to Austria on that one. Um, oh, uh, yeah, that would that would have been great, and and that's been one of the blessings of my job is to see so much of the country, so much of the world, um, all fifty states, and a number of. Uh, of countries uh, close and far in my in my travels. Okay, before we get uh, international, let's let's keep it local because you're working in the Bay Area, uh, doing local radio and TV. Uh, I I started in Santa Barbara in Southern California uh, in local radio uh, just as a, a evening disc jockey, and then graduated to run their four-hour morning news program with uh, four other people and it was uh, uh, a high-speed spinning top uh, every morning just trying to keep it going um, it was great experience and a couple of people from that news group had moved on to a local TV station and uh, when a weekend sports casting job opened up at that station I kind of had a pipeline there and I auditioned and, uh, you know, they hired me, uh, I think, the next day. And I stayed with that local TV station for several years. Uh, I found an interview that talks about the fact that you were at the 1989 World Series uh, where the earthquake, you know, cut out the broadcast. Yeah, that um, I was just talking with somebody about that that recently. Uh, I was I had moved to the Bay Area uh, after my time at the Santa Maria TV station, KCOI, and uh, I was freelancing here and there trying to find gigs. I had a friend who had done some work years ago on, on uh, Monday Night Football, and so uh, it was ABC had had the World Series, and they knew some people and got me a gig, and um, I was in the broadcast booth. Uh, standing next to Al Michaels. I was going to be Al Michaels' official scorekeeper for that night. And um, so it was uh, Jim Palmer and, and Tim McCarver. And in the booth also were all their families from New York. And uh, at 5.04, I think it was, or 5.06, uh, the earthquake hit. And I was one of two people out of 20 in that booth area who lived in the Bay Area in, in California and was kind of shepherding people around and telling people really what's happening with this earthquake. They had no idea that I mentioned. Now, everyone, there's going to be aftershocks. And I mentioned aftershocks, and Tim McCarver went through the roof, and he started screaming, aftershocks. What do you mean after? What are aftershocks? I don't, I, I, <laughs> calm down, Tim. Just another earthquake. Um and uh, so that was, yeah, that was uh, an evening I'll never forget. And uh, it took, you know, four or five hours to get out of the stadium. We hung around not knowing if we were going back on the air or not. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the rest is history. Al Michaels took over the broadcast and took over ABC Evening News with Peter Jennings and uh, did a great job all night long because he knows the area. He's local. 
Yeah, I was I was uh, watching a, a quick interview clip with Bob Costas after the fact. Apparently, he was maybe in the in the booth next to you guys and was describing the swaying. The Oakland A's take. Take. I'll tell you what, we're having a real. There's 60 some thousand fans at Candlestick Park tonight. The ballpark itself did suffer some damage. No one hurt or injured or killed there, we're told. The third game of the World Series, however, was understandably canceled. Joining us now is Bob Costas of NBC Hello, Sports. Were you at Candlestick? Yeah, I was in the press box right alongside the ABC broadcasting position, and it, it shook. It shook pretty well. And, and you got that reaction of nervous laughter from people at first. Yeah, after all, the people I was surrounded with are, uh, are news people. They tend to be, uh, as a group, sports writers tend to be uh, cynical, and they were kind of they were nervous titters at first but then after it stopped you saw the blood drain from people's faces and, uh, and they, they couldn't hide how shaken they were by it. and then you wonder especially those who are not natives of this area and, and have no background uh, in having been through earthquakes or hearing other people talk about it they wonder what's next if that was just the prelude to something bigger and people were definitely very shaken uh, but they had oh, yeah. done some work to the stadium I guess to, to solidify it yeah, uh, that was all before it was uh, legally required to retrofit uh, public areas and, and stadiums. Diane Feinstein uh, was the mayor of San Francisco at the time, and she proactively forced uh, the retroactive shoring up of Candlestick, which uh, Candlestick for the longest time was actually the oldest uh, National League baseball stadium, even though Nixon was there to christen it in 1960 or something like <laughs> that. Um, it was the oldest stadium, and so she knew the danger. She recognized what could happen, and um, I, I truly believe to this day that she saved mine and hundreds, perhaps thousands of lives by having that retrofitted. Um, and there was nary a crack. I actually did go back the next day uh, after I finally got home, I, I, went back, I had to go back up the next day because I had just bought a new truck, a little Toyota pickup truck, and I parked about a half mile from the stadium and locked my keys in my truck <laughs> before I went to work that night. And I came back. I told the producer, hey, I locked my keys. I'll be back in a minute. I went back, and I had literally four San Francisco cops with their Slim Jims working on my truck trying to open it. And Toyota had done something different where you couldn't break in like that. <laughs> and they couldn't break into my truck, and I had to leave it. And I had to find a ride home and find a ride back and get my truck. But anyway, uh, I went back the next day and went to the only section out up in center field where some concrete had crumbled and absconded with a piece of concrete. And so I've got that and my uh, World Series pass from that day that's uh, kind of sitting on a mantle place as a place of honor. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I was reading about the fact that, uh, for those that don't know, this was Oakland versus San Francisco in the World Series. So the whole region was glued to the TV or, or home, which apparently saved a bunch of lives. You know, nobody was out commuting at the time. So. Yeah, it helped. It helped. Uh, obviously, you know, the main bridge went down, but uh, so there's always going to be people in at 5 o'clock. That's rush hour. So uh, they were very lucky. Uh, to get away w with that but yeah unfortunately a lot of people did die both on the Oakland side and, and on the bridge and you know in the fire in the marina so tell me about how you got the first gig with ESPN uh, so I had been uh, when I moved up to the Bay Area I, my, my goal uh, in addition to covering skiing in Austria was <laughs> to get back home and work as a sportscaster in San Francisco. And I thought that's really what I wanted to do. So I had been on air in Santa Maria on the TV station for about four years. And at, at that stage of someone's career in my place, the normal thing to do, and I, and I saw the revolving door at this TV station with a lot of my cohorts, was to, you know, you do your job, uh, at this tiny, you know, little Santa Maria station, then you get a job at a little bigger market and then another market and you keep bouncing around and hopefully you're going up or wrong every time you move. I had family and I just didn't want to move to Idaho, you know, or yeah. Nebraska. 
and drag my family around the country in hopes of getting back to San Francisco. So I made the decision to stay where I was. Um, and I overstayed my welcome a little bit. And, you know, we kind of wore each other out, management and me. But learn all I could and hopefully just make the leap up back home to the Bay Area. And like I said, my brother was in TV ahead of me. He knew some people and I had met them already and I knew them. And so I reached out. My brother just gave me names and, and introductions. He didn't lay any groundwork other than that. And, and I sent him my reel and everything. And so I got hired to do some freelance fill-in sports casting uh, in San Francisco and um, went on up there and worked for a lot of the TV stations there uh, weekends, but mostly the, the ABC affiliate, uh, KGO TV, working a lot of weekend sports, did production, produced the 49ers, the first San Francisco 49er, you know, Super Bowl parade in San Francisco. And so I did a lot of things. I was well-rounded. And uh, at that time, that station was owned by a company called Cap Cities, which also owned ESPN. And so we had a strong connection with ESPN. We would share footage with them uh, for our sports cast back and forth. And then I met some people and started getting a couple of gigs. And then I started working for a sports production company and then uh, started my own sports production company and new people at ESPN. And we got a show onto ESPN that we produced. Um, it was kind of a triathlete type show that incidentally Lance Armstrong was the winner. And um, I hired myself to host it. And so oh. <laughs> uh, I knew it was going to be on ESPN. I said, damn it, I'm going to hire myself so I can get on ESPN. So I did that show uh, and then more and more started doing some little features for ESPN. And uh, when ESPN2 started, there was a, a lot of slots open and uh, a lot more opportunities to get on the air. And so did over 100 features for what their, what their version of Sports Center was called Sports Night with Susie Culber and a leather jacketed uh, Keith Oberman and um, just kind of built built off that. I became a known and trusted entity for ESPN. And, you know, overnight, uh, 10 years later, got the World Series of Poker gig. <laughs> well, before we get to poker, let's talk about those random gigs in between because huh. on the resume we got, well, the X Games. Obviously, I think you won an award for your work on the X Games. That was huge. Yeah, the X Games was, was a huge thing. Um and the work I was doing for ESPN2 was, because ESPN2 was, uh, I mentioned the leather jacket of Keith Olbermann, and that was by design. It was a hipper, younger crowd. This is What's in your mama's there? ESPN. What's that? This is in your mama's ESPN. Not your mama's ESPN. No, it was the, the era of... You know, when you're interviewing someone, the camera is rotating around them and shooting them from up. You know, it's just like, you know, skateboarder. It was a skateboard network, basically. And we tried to be <laughs> hip, and tried to be always fast paced and moving and um, edgy and funny and and not your normal sports casting. And um, so that I love that. I, I love, you know you know, a little muckraking and, and something different and having fun on the air and being snarky and all. And so all of the 125 or 50 features I did had that edge to it. And there was a lot of, a lot of skateboarding, a lot of skiing, uh, ice climbing and, and <laughs> cycling and stuff like that. And that dovetailed perfectly into working on the X Games when ESPN decided to, to really jump into it and I was there at the time and uh so got hired to work on the X Games the first I think three uh dry land and the first two uh, winter X Games I worked on and it was a it was you know hand in glove you know this is what I was doing already I knew a lot of the guys who were going to be guys and gals who were going to be on uh performing uh and competing in the X Games and so it was just natural to have me be part of it as well and that was that was my first big uh, really monster ES event, uh, ESPN event that I was able to be a part of, and it was great. Well, X Games obviously have a bunch of very various events. Uh, then on the resume, we also have skiing, as you mentioned, kickboxing, billiards, uh, bowling. What when ESPN comes to you with a job offer, do they ask you if you know anything about the sport, 
or is it just a you know a, a known thing that Lon will do the research and <laughs> oh, get it done? Well, it um, they they expect you. I mean that, that it's not a brand new sport. You know you can know something about it. But my role uh, is is always different. Obviously, I need to know about it and know enough about it to to sound kind of smart and ask the right questions. But my role uh, is the TV guy, you know, and read the intro, you know, and get us to break and get us back from break. And, and oftentimes I worked with uh, a person who was coming out of that particular sport that we're covering. And the one that pops into mind was, uh, it was called board to board. Half the show was wakeboarding, half the board was snowboarding, half the show was snowboarding. And likewise with competitors, half and half. And you had the crossover snowboarders trying to wakeboard and the wakeboarders trying to snowboard. So it's like, what do I know about this? And <laughs> so you have people coming out of those disciplines working with me who are certainly experts in their sport, but not experts in describing their sport or being a good color analyst. And so my job was to uh, bring out the best of what they had to offer in that setting and and that's where my interviewing skills came in because i could subtly interview them while making them a tv partner while getting the information out of them and into the ears of the viewers and so that was my role they saw that as a real bonus uh that i was able to do that and and have it easily digestible for the viewers uh this weird sport and so they you know, again, they trusted me with that, and um, uh, I was blessed that, you know, they kept calling. Well, I think you're also selling yourself short on the amount of research you have to do, right? Because you did uh, uh, the pride fighting on, on um, uh, MMA fighting, right? Uh, yeah. You can't just jump into that without knowing the terminology, right? I mean, I've been no. watching MMA for years, and I still don't know what a Kimura is. <laughs> well, it... Uh... I had been uh, lucky enough before I hooked up with ESPN to do a lot of kickboxing. Well, actually, they were doing ESPN. It was Strike Force on ESPN. Yeah, my first show on ESPN was that one I produced with a partner back in the early 90s. And then after that, stuff here and there popped up. And then I hooked up with the kickboxing group, <clears throat> which became Strike Force, and which is now... Um, Oh, they've got different names, but the same guy, Scott Coker, is uh, involved with it. Um, and so I did a lot of kickboxing events, which I thought was the greatest combat sport there was, because uh, you have punching and you have kicking. <laughs> and so uh, without <laughs> the, the down, both worlds. Yeah, without the ground fighting. Um, and so then that, when, when MMA started, you know, poking its head up and becoming more popular, we started doing a couple of those shows. We did some pay-per-view stuff uh, in Vegas every year, and, and we did one in Tokyo. And um, and uh, I did the first legal MMA show in, in California. And so, yeah, there there was I already knew a lot of it. I, you saw a lot of the kickboxing fighters were crossing over to MMA. And even some of the guys that I called back in the late 90s, um, both in Vegas and the pay-per-view shows and the one we did, we did a Bob Sapp show in Tokyo. Um, there's, you know, we, st we still see them. Mark Hunt uh, is still fighting MMA and, and Alistair Overeem is still fighting <laughs> these days. Uh, yeah. you know, 22 years later, it's like, wow, <laughs> don't you have any <laughs> new people that can come in? <laughs> but uh, so I knew a lot of the guys, a lot of the terminology and a lot of the people who were working on the shows. Again, I was, I was a, a trusted entity uh, that could get us through on those. A lot of it was long, long pay-per-view shows, um, which has kind of become my strength because, you know, we get long, long main event shows too. And so yeah. I can handle that. You've got to be able to be on air for 12 hours without saying something stupid. <laughs> uh, that's impossible, by the way, as you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we had Norman on the show, he was describing... Speaking of... Uh, <laughs> he was <laughs> he was describing uh, professional bowling as as the dream broadcaster gig. Uh, do you agree? Because you actually worked for the PBA, right? I did a year of PBA. I did. Um, it was uh, it was a uh, one of the more uh, 
nerve wracking things uh, because it like poker. It's like I had to learn about poker. I had to learn how to broadcast poker. And the same thing with with bowling. There's there's a lot that goes on uh, and a lot of uh, nuance in every competition um, that you have to learn. And it was hit and miss on when when the shows are going to be happening. And it was a time uh, where bowling is, you know, not at its zenith in popularity. (laughs) And um, I was working with a guy who uh, actually with Randy Peterson, who came out of Santa Maria, who won his first PBA match, a PBA event, while he was living in Santa Maria, while I was working in my TV job in Santa Maria. I had him on the set a couple of times. And then suddenly, here we are, you know, 30 years later, plus working together. And uh, he helped me a lot. I I tried to learn and pick up things. And then um, it came the end of the year. And the guy who was running our shows and running the budget, he wasn't often on site. So he's one of those important guys, you know, in the corner offices somewhere. And um, he left a budget behind and then left the PBA to go work for Twitter. And I get the word a week later that his, his budget that he left behind had no budget for a play by play announcer. And (laughs) And so I wasn't coming back uh, because there's no budget. And they ended up hiring the guy who was already an employee of the PBA um, who was doing the crowd announcing live on site at each event. He was like the PA announcer and pumping people up and letting people know. He was he knew everything. He was very good, but it was just a weird way to get fired, I guess, as it were. Maybe I was fired. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I would. I'm actually thinking about after I heard your interview with Norman, reaching out to some people I know who still work there, um, and I think you know I, I would love to have me and Norman and I could work any gig I think and it would be fun. Uh, but to have us working on a show that I worked on before and then a sport that he has a passion for, and it is a real passion for him, uh, I think would be a kick in the pants. I think it would, I think it would <laughs> I really do. I think you'd get a lot of poker people coming over to check it out just for fun anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, our style, I think, again, it goes back to uh, kind of the ESPN two early days where it's like, there are no norms. We're creating the norms here, uh, how we do things. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be snarky. It's going to be a little cynical. And you know, that's, those are Norman's middle names. And I, I think, uh, we could definitely bring in a new audience. Um, if they really wanted to go in that direction, it would change the broadcast, but <laughs> be a good thing could be a good thing. Uh, can you talk real quickly about the Scrabble Championships and how do you cover that? <laughs> <laughs> Again, one of those things where and my role is to say, here we are, welcome, here's what happened, <laughs> why did that happen, Stefan? Uh, I work with Stefan Fatsis, who was actually the sports reporter, uh, writer for the Wall Street Journal whenever they had a sports column, I think on Fridays. But he, he got into Scrabble, did the world tour, wrote a book about Scrabble, and uh, somebody decided to do a couple of years of the uh, World Scrabble Championship. And so, again, my role at that point, and still in poker, with, with poker's changing strategy every 20 minutes, it's like I see somebody do something, and I remember when Amarillo Slim did that, and it meant one thing back then, and it means something totally different now, uh, the kind of bet somebody puts out. So I can't keep up with that the way poker players can keep up with that. So instead of me saying, this is why he's doing it, it's like, this is what he did. Now tell me why he did it. And that's what the right. the other guy is supposed to do. And that's how I've always you know, pictured my job is to say what happened and then lead the analyst into telling us why it happened. And um, that was uh, the epitome of that, doing Scrabble, because I look at the rack of Scrabble letters, and I see a rack of Scrabble letters, and my uh, co-announcer sees, you know, 17 words, and, you know, (laughs) nine steps ahead like a chess match. And uh, it was very eye-opening, both the culture of Scrabble 
and uh, the idiot savant brilliance of the best people that play it. So how does poker come into your life then? Uh, in 2002, you get the gig with Gabe Kaplan to cover the World Series of Poker. Yeah, yeah. my good friend Gabe Kaplan. Um, <laughs> I had, uh, okay, so I had done billiards just before that, and I was working with a group out of Indianapolis uh, doing billiard shows. And we did, billiards was big back in that day, and we were doing live billiard shows from, from Disney World where we had two tables, uh, the women's tour on one table with two announcers and the men's tour that I covered with, uh, you know, me and another announcer. And so uh, those producers um, decide that they are going to do a poker show. And so they picked me because they knew me. And I did a poker show, the Jack Binion World Poker Open. And um, crazy flight. Uh to Indianapolis on an overnight flight from Vegas with uh, a crazy poker player, Mike Lang, the clown prince of poker back mm. in the day. And he almost got us arrested on the airplane. And uh, <laughs> But we did this poker show, and it made it onto ESPN. These producers were very adept in putting shows together. I did snow shovel racing with them. That's how good they are. And uh, <laughs> so... We uh, got the show on ESPN, and then ESPN uh, was offered some footage from the O2 main event, which was not shot live. It was shot by a company out of Vegas that had shot like every other main event that happened um, and had the footage. And then in January of O3, decided they wanted to put a show together, and then I got the call from uh, ESPN because I had done one poker show and of course they knew me from through all the years and nobody else in Bristol, Connecticut wanted to even touch a poker show, I'm sure. And, uh, and I said, okay, sure. And so I went to Las Vegas and Gabe Kaplan and I, you know, voiced the, the shows and I haven't seen them since. I, they're probably terrible. And um, <laughs> then well, I guess that. I'm remembering them incorrectly because I assumed you were on hand for when the whole Helmuth shaving his head because Varconi one thing happened. Uh, no, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was a big reveal when Norman was on as well. The fact that you guys don't do um, the broadcast live, it's all after the fact. Yeah, all the tape shows... Uh, uh, all like like he mentioned, you know, he fooled or we fooled some of the his people that he knows in industry, um, and that uh, wasn't by design. We never really came out and said we're live or we're not. We just wanted you to feel the presence of the event. Um, but you know, it was a, it was kind of mind boggling that people think that a final table is done in you know forty six minutes every week. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so they, they called me in, and Gabe and I met up in, in Vegas, and um, it was a great throw for the people at my house when, when they picked up the phone and Gabe Kaplan was on the other end. It's like, hey, Gabe Kaplan's on the phone, Gabe Kaplan's on the phone. <laughs> and uh, so um, that's kind of how that came to be. And, and at that point uh, is another, you know, fork in the road for me because I uh, – was not working much at the time and had lost a lot of my gigs and uh, had started to get away from television because there was no more TV for me to announce and got into a different profession at that time. Right. So you do this one off with Gabe and you're not thinking this is going to turn into something. You're thinking I got to no. find steady work. Oh yeah, absolutely. I had mortgage to pay. So when I guess when it comes to being a sportscaster, I guess a lot of people don't realize you're not just on salary for a network necessarily. You are actively trying to find jobs, you know, month to month. Oh, abs yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's what I was doing. And um, it was uh, a freelance world it, it, that I likened to um, acting. 
you know, a, an actor in, in, in L.A. that is starting out and having to wait tables to make ends meet. And then you kind of look around for work here and there in between, you know, gigs of waiting tables. Well, I was in a similar situation where um, I didn't have any other work. And I, I had a lot of work. And then all of a sudden, I didn't have any work. It just the way that the circumstances were at that time. And there was no work coming in. And so um, I would not under salary. I'm still a freelance operator, uh, still paying my own health insurance and doing my own taxes and, you know, having to pay quarterlies and all like that. So um, it was just something I chose. But as everybody in that situation knows, you know, most of your job is looking for jobs, and it's one of the toughest things you can do. Yeah. Well, so your side job at the time was a mortgage banker. Like, how do you just randomly fall into that? <laughs> well, uh, again, just kismet. You know, I I, uh, I tried to make ends meet for 18 months, and, you know, we managed to, you know, pay the mortgage and, and keep the kids in school, but... Um, there were times uh, it was real tough, you know, go to the ATM machine and it spits out zeros on the little receipt. And uh, that was happening a lot back there in between little gigs that I was trying to pick up. And, uh, it, you know, you just sit down and my wife and I had uh, met in college at the college radio station. So she knew how important uh, sports casting and, and broadcasting was to me. But at some point, we literally sat down at the kitchen table and said, uh, I guess we had a good run and the broadcasting career is over and let's move on. And I happen to have a friend working um, high up somewhere in, in uh, Washington Mutual Bank who always said, if you need something, let me know. And so I was like, I go from, you know, the glamorous life of a sportscaster to a bank. It's like, I really don't want to do this. But had to do it. And so I went into training to become a mortgage lender for Washington Mutual. And it was a real blessing in disguise because they were wonderful people. I worked with uh, a terrific organization. They got a bad rap later on with the mortgage thing, but uh, we weren't part of that and uh, where I worked. But I worked during the high times, uh, 02 to 08, um, in the mortgage business. And it was while I had the gig, I loved them so much and loved my job so much that I did both after the poker came back and, and some TV work came back. I did both for several years. I worked at the bank during the week and then in time off and on weekends. When it came up, I worked on World Series of Poker. So Yeah, there's some people in their cars right now having to pull over when they heard you say, oh, eight. Uh, especially given the explosion that happened in popularity for poker in 2003. Uh, so even though, you know, that was booming and you had suddenly become known f for your work in poker, you were still playing it safe and keeping the day job. I was, and I, I really felt I owed it to the people I worked for who were so good to me early on because it was so funny when I, when I started – uh, when I got the call from an unknown producer in ESPN who somehow got the phone number to my desk at the bank in Sunnyvale, California, and said, do you want to do this 03 World Series of Poker? Um, I said, I don't know. I gave up TV. Uh, I'm done. Um, he says, well, you know, we saw you did the show. We'd like you to do it. Somebody familiar with poker to do this. And I said, I don't know if I can do it. I, and I hung up, and I had to look to see if I had enough vacation time in 03 to work <laughs> on crazy. it. That's crazy. And uh, I did, and the manager said, oh, yeah, go ahead. And so I was flying back and forth. I was going to um, New York on the weekends and coming back to my job Monday morning and uh, stayed with the bank because they were so good to me during that time. I wasn't going to just, you know, kick him out the door but also you have to remember Julio that the first World Series of Poker even though you look back and that 03 show and people remember there was hardly ever a time you could walk into a restaurant or bar and not have that the face of Sammy Farha and Chris Moneymaker on the TV 
we did only six hours, I think, of, of shows that year. And ESPN ran it almost 1,300 times. <laughs> so it seemed like I was always at work, but it was six hours of work. You know, six hours of programming. <laughs> and that's not going to cover me for the next 11 months. I had to, st- I had to keep working. It was the only gig I had was the bank and the poker. So when 04 came around, we did a few more shows. And by that time, the, the bank manager was like, oh, wow. It's nice to have a celebrity on staff. I really like this. And in my role, I was kind of a freelancer, even though I was, a, I was an employee of the bank. But I was all I did was lending. I didn't do any banking or anything like that. And I did a good job. So I made him money. And to keep me happy, he made more money. So I went off again, did my gig in 04. 05 came around, and we're doing more shows. And after a a few years of doing both um we got up to doing i think from the original six shows in 03 i think uh, like three or four years later we were doing like 45 or 50 shows of poker during the year <clears throat> and i just couldn't keep both going and i finally had to bow out of the from the bank um it was a good time because as you know 08 things kind of went south in the mortgage world and so it was a good time to get out and uh but i owe them a lot and uh it was a great experience it really was now you you had all these crazy sports you you were doing over the years and obviously x games kind of blew up and that was big but you couldn't have seen the way poker blew up right like how surprised were you you, like you said, seeing it in every bar, playing constantly. And also, why doesn't ESPN kick you some sort of residual <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> when, when they, when they uh, re-air these things? I figured you'd at least get a, a nickel each time. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that. They, they, that's always been a thing. People always think, you know, that's how the house is paid by how many times ESPN runs it. Uh, but no, that's not the ESPN business model. Uh, and <laughs> they later became a, a, a Disney uh company and and it fit very well with the disney disney mentality and and a quick story <laughs> to that is i was covering i was doing uh some yacht racing a couple of years i did uh event where uh, the yachts <laughs> would race from california to honolulu uh, called the transpac and one of the uh, the boats was owned by roy disney the nephew of walt who looked just like walt by the way so I got to know him pretty well. Uh, this one particular year, he had broken his leg uh, riding around his little convertible outside his Irish castle. And so he couldn't race his boat, but his son was on the boat. And we were going to do the shows in Honolulu. And he says, hey, uh, we're heading to Honolulu in my private jet. Would you like to come along? And we're going to fly and try to find the boat somewhere between uh, LA and Honolulu and kind of buzz them and have fun and talk to them over the radio and all like that. And I was like, Oh, I'd love to go, but I can't. Uh, what? <laughs> I had another gig before I got to Honolulu. So I had to fly commercial to Honolulu. So I couldn't fly on Roy Disney's private jet. And then, um, after, you know, we do the shows and we do stuff with Roy and Hey, how are you doing? See you, Roy. And I called Roy a few months later. My family wanted to go to Disneyland. I called his office. I said, hey, Roy, uh, me and, you know, family four want to go to Disneyland. Can you set up some tickets? And he says, Lon, we didn't get to be Disney Corporation by giving it away free. <laughs> it's like, okay. Oh. So no residuals to answer your question in a long-winded way. Um, but uh, that was nice. But again, you know, it Come was so on, few Roy. Hours. So few hours of programming, right? So few hours. Hook a guy up with a tour or something. <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, just not the way they do it. And and I we knew that going <laughs> in. Residuals are a, a union thing. Uh, I do get residuals from a, a film I did, and every quarter I get a check for net three dollars and eighty seven cents or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> what wait? What about with ESPN series Tilt? Uh, we just don't talk about that, and so we don't care if we get paid or not. <laughs> That's what you. First of all, it wasn't a race from history. You could find it right now on Tubi <laughs> free. Anybody listening out there, just download the Tubi app, whatever that is. Um, Some people did like it a lot. Some people. I I was the right 
age and yeah. time in my poker career for that show. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm also from Miami, and there was a character named Miami. All right. So that helped. <laughs> yeah. That but you played, you played yourself. What was that like playing yourself? Yeah. Oh, I loved it. Uh, we, they shot in a, uh, in a warehouse, in this warehouse district in the middle of winter outside Toronto. Um, and it's really the first movie set I'd been on. And they did an amazing job because the way they shot it, uh, it really, it wasn't just a, a front or a facade. They really had to build a casino inside this warehouse. And so you walk into the set area and it, it really looks like you're in an actual casino and um, had my own trailer, uh, had people who, you know, thought I was important and, uh, it was, it was a ball. I went there once on uh, my own and then to do some scenes and then flew back again, uh, with Norman and we had to do some stuff, uh, together on there. It was, I, I loved it. It was great. Uh, let's see. We asked Norman, what was something about you, uh, that we didn't, that the world didn't know that he'd like to share. And I think he said something about you being secretly evil or something. Oh, um, the other Right, the other lawn. That's what the other yeah. lawn, that's right. Evil, mean lawn. <laughs> right. So, you know, let's put the shoe on the other foot. What's something <laughs> about Norman that uh, we all should know that we don't? Um, obviously, everyone's aware of, of his persona um, and the tirades and the cynicism and, and all like that. But the one thing I, I already knew about him uh, before we met, uh, obviously, was his sense of humor. But what gets lost in all that, and I think what's kind of hidden, because a, a lot of it comes through in, in, in meetings and in between our live takes on how the shows are going to proceed, is his journalistic integrity um, and his... Uh, his passion for getting it right, whatever it is, uh, whether it's stuff that he writes, uh, uh, the amazing amount of research that he does, the the serious way. Uh, I know I'm not dishing on him, you know, and I'm blowing, you know, I'm blowing him up to be this hero, but he really has been a hero to me. Well, you're making him feel like a jerk for saying such yeah, nice I, things about him. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's him, you know, uh, and, but, um, he, I always thought with the backbone and, and so much of the heart of the early shows, uh, and that's carried into, into our, the shows these days. And, um, it, he has really been such a driving force in making the shows what they are and, and how good they are, uh, in a journalistically in, in integrity uh, that he brings and, the ideas and and um, he just has a good sense of what's right uh, when it comes to television. I think, and uh, we owe a lot to him uh, that people really don't realize. Look, I, I want to uh, bring up something you mentioned. You know, Norman's humor. I got to say, one of the, the things I think that is really underrated about your abilities is the the fact that you are so good at laughing at these jokes. <laughs> When I know you, you can see it coming. You've probably heard it four or five times beforehand, but I still believe you every time that you find him amusing. And for that matter, you know that you find Scrabble uh, entertaining, <laughs> or whatever the sport may be. Uh, you, you know that's acting, as far as I'm concerned. Well, it isn't, and it isn't actually, Julio, because uh, all right, we'll start with the laughing. <laughs> When I was on the phone for so many years, um, I would hang up the phone, and my wife would come in and say, that was Norman, wasn't it? And just because I was laughing. Um, when Before we did the shows, uh, Friday uh, morning paper, San Jose Mercury News, I'm reading a column, I'm laughing. And she says, you're reading Norman again, aren't you? And I always thought, he was funny because his column ran in our, in our local newspaper. And then I, I heard I was going to be working with him and I was thrilled. And it, there's something about his humor uh, that really goes very well with, with my sensibilities of things. And 
yeah, uh, there are times where we heard it two or three times, but what you don't know and what you don't see is that as he's saying it for the third or fourth time, you know, we're looking at each other with this little glimmer in each other's eyes. So there's maybe something else we're laughing about or how he's going to say at that time or hoping he gets through it. Um, <laughs> you know, we could be in our 11th hour of working and it takes us 20 minutes to get through a line just because <laughs> there's, there's, you know, one of those church laughs where you're, you're not supposed to laugh, but you can't help but laugh type thing. And uh, it's happened so many times. So it, <laughs> most of my laughs are genuine. They really are. Uh, cause I, I think the guy's hilarious. Well, Norman has spent uh, many of the years trying to, uh, work up these catchphrases of his. I'm wondering if you ever tried to force a catchphrase or even in other uh, broadcasts over the years. Uh, no, I, 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 there's what I'm still working on, but it would only works best with the, with when we're taping the shows. Um, and I, you just uh, try to get things you know, I don't think I've ever coined any phrases. Um, there's been guys who've done, who want me to, you know, call a nine on the river on their radio show or something like that. Maybe they, you know, I get so excited about the river card. They, <laughs> they, they, and, and that's genuine. I mean, you talk about Scrabble, you talk about poker. Um, Norman and I discuss this where we both seem to have a little break in the synapses in our brain some sort of mental illness that when we're watching the show and and taping it for air we somehow can believe this is the first time we've seen it and this is the first time we're calling it and so it is in essence new to us each time we do it uh because we both do share a passion for making it right and, and making it the best can be and we both have this little quirk in our brain where we can believe we're seeing it for the first time. If I'm calling a big river card that knocks somebody out uh, and have to do it four or five times, it's not often we have to do that, but it has to be done sometimes. So yeah, that's where the acting part does come in, but still we're believing what we're saying and what we're feeling. So it's, it's kind of, kind of weird, but kind of cool. Do you have a, a proudest moment uh, in poker broadcasting? Um, oh, let me go. I'm sorry. Uh, there was, let me go back just a second. But I was trying to coin a phrase. Uh, that's where I was going. Oh, yeah, that's right. And, and of course, there's the, the door card or the window card, the first one you see. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought each flop card should have their own name. And okay. So the window and then the first one out. The last one could be like the porch because it's at the back of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got the kitchen in the middle. And I think I even tried that a couple of times. And I was like, oh, that might work. And it's like, you know, because somebody's got a set of sixes or a, a pair of sixes and you see a six. You know, there's a six in the window. And I said, well, okay, what? Well, it's a middle card. Well, there's a six right in the kitchen. You know, it's right in this kitchen. Or there's a six <laughs> on the back porch for the set. I think it could work. I still think I'm going to try to work it in one way or another. I like it. Why not have every other card has a name, but the flop there, there's like, you know, it's a group, but every the card, it's, has you're right. The window has a name, but none of the other two are just sitting there nameless. Yeah, what's wrong with them? <laughs> Why give them short shrift? What was your the question? The kitchen, the kitchen and the porch. <laughs> the kitchen, right? It's in the middle of the house, right? The kitchen. I think you just answered house. my question. Um, yeah. I asked you what was your proudest moment in poker? And I'm pretty sure go. inventing <laughs> that terminology qualifies. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, in poker, um, well, let's, let's, let's get on the topic of, you know, it, yeah. I was very proud to be nominated for hall of fame, but exactly. it's, it's just keeping it going, you know, and keeping it fresh. Um, I work very hard at, um, when I'm making my notes for a show that, you know, I, 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 I write something down on how I describe a flop. It says, no, nah, I did that. I've already done that. That's what's another way to say that. So I'm trying to keep it fresh, keep it in a way where people want to pay attention because they don't just already know what's coming, um, where they're kind of anticipating something different. I think that's really what I hinge my career on is trying to make it a little spicy and, and different, unique, but still um, 
with integrity and 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 make it make it right is the bottom line most of the time. Obviously, you share Norman's opinion that uh, you know there are more deserving people uh, ahead of you for the Poker Hall of Fame. Uh, but I mean, obviously, you gotta it's gotta feel good to be nominated. You know, you, got, you have to understand why that that would be the case and see your contributions. Oh, I uh, yeah. It it you know people say it's just an honor to be nominated and it's true, um, to be mentioned with all the people who have been nominated to to think that you know you'd be part of of poker lore in in that way um, was a was a big honor. It was a nice. Uh, it really was a, a kick in the pants, and I I had no uh, belief that we would get in this year. Uh, people say, oh, you're going to be in someday, you know, and Phil Helmuth, typical Phil Helmuth, he tweeted, you know, oh, no, it's not going to be Norman Longier, 19, uh, 2023, that's their year. It's, <laughs> he, said, it's, he said too soon this year. And I went back after I read that, and uh, you think the first bracelet that, uh, that uh, uh, Phil got was his main event bracelet in 89. <laughs> And he was put into the Hall of Fame 17 years later. Well, we've been doing the shows for like 18 years. Yet he said it's too soon for us to be. You're right. Typical Helmuth fashion, you know. It's not good enough for you, but it's okay for me, type thing. Anyway, but I I can't. Yeah, I mean, how long does the average poker career even last? (laughs) (laughs) Right, the average career. It's they like talk the NFL, about yeah. The well, they talk about the NFL career was like two and a half years. You know, I mean the same thing with poker, probably. <laughs> yeah, anybody who could last a decade or even two, you know, yeah, no doubt be qualifying. But yeah, there should be different categories. There should be more people put in every year. Uh, we do need to, you know, we shouldn't be the U.S. Poker Hall of Fame, as Norman mentioned, and a lot of people have mentioned. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of. Uh, you know, a lot of things that could be improved, but the people who are running it are doing it for free anyway. So we got to just, you know, we have what we have and deal with it. Exactly. Uh, you've interviewed all these people over the years, you know, celebrities, sports stars. Have you ever been starstruck? Yes, um, I have. Uh, and it's uh, two three <laughs> three or four times actually okay <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll start from the lower starstruckness was uh my first ever in the field report when i was a tv reporter was covering opening day at dodger stadium and i got to interview vin scully um so that was a thrill that's awesome uh, um, i don't know if i ever interviewed him but i uh Willie Mays was another hero of mine. Um, and then, uh, but the two guys I was really starstruck, again, number two would be, uh, since for some reason I grew up on the West Coast when there was no hockey, but I was a huge Wayne Gretzky fan. So I got to work, uh, interview Wayne Gretzky a couple of times and just, uh, I was a producer of a story that Jim Lampley was doing on him and, so I dug deep, you know, and, and just learned everything I could about him. Talked to Wayne's dad and, and up in the Toronto area. And um, so that was number two. But number one was uh, twice I got to uh, interview uh, Muhammad Ali. And wow. once he came to San Luis Obispo to the men's prison there to do a talk and so i was working in santa maria and and did a thing there with him and then the other time was when i was doing a pay-per-view um kickboxing show at the bellagio and mike tyson was in the audience during the height of his his badness and he just gotten the tattoo on his face and so we took a shot of him and he's got a thing of popcorn in his hand and he's holding it and Muhammad Ali is sitting next to him because Ali can't hold the popcorn because he shakes too much. Yeah. And it's like feeding Muhammad Ali popcorn. <laughs> and so then after the show, we heard there was a big get-together. 
at this point, uh, K1 was the show. They were owned by a Japanese group. And they were doing a big get-together in a ballroom at the Bellagio. And I was a play-by-play announcer. I proudly walked up to the door with my pass and started walking through the door and was grabbed and said, uh, you're not allowed in here with that pass? I was like, excuse me? <laughs> I could see literally a wall of sushi in there. <laughs> really cool. It was at the Bellagio upper level that overlooked the courtyard and all the pools and everything, and I, it was beautiful. Well, I then, as I walked out with my tail between my legs, realized that Michael Buffer, who was our ring announcer that night, when he was done, he came over, said goodnight, the bar broadcast booth, took off his press pass and set it down on my table. I went back in the arena and got Michael Buffer's press pass and strolled through the front door. And then you said, the, let's get ready to rumble? To the sushi. <laughs> no, because Bruce Buffer would have sued you if you said that, because that was his job at the time. Um, so I walk in, and I look over to my left at a little tiny table. All alone is Mike Tyson eating. Huh. Wow. And I look to my right, and there's a table where Muhammad Ali is sitting on a line of about 30 people waiting to talk to him. And I got in line because he was such a hero of mine. And <laughs> so many of them. And I waited my turn, got up front, sat down. The Bellagio photographer took our picture, and he was, he was just hamming it up. You know, he put the fist up, your fist against his jaw, and he looked like he was being punched by me and I being punched by him and making faces. And he takes off a piece of paper that we had for our uh, fighter biographs, uh, biographies, and he turned it over. And for everybody in line, he drew a picture of a boxing ring and that signified one of his big fights. And he dated it and put my name on it and signed it. And uh, I still have it. It's a treasured thing in my house right now. That's but awesome. Number one, I think. That's awesome. <clears throat> Wow. I like that you uh you have to steal a press pass, but you got it done. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> got it also done. the fact that, that Mike Tyson there was no line for Mike Tyson and everyone there was just nobody, bored him. No, nobody wanted to bother Mike Tyson. <laughs> I mean that was, you know, he was a badass back then. He always is. He, but now, you know, he does stand up comedy and works on, you know, on the hangover movies. But um back then he was he was scary bad Mike Tyson and nobody uh, wanted any part of him yeah the the face tattoo has made him more approachable for sure oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh you've been all over for your jobs what what was low-key the best uh spot the best gig just for loca- location oh oh hands down was the earlier i mentioned the wakeboarding snowboarding show that we did it was my first trip to the british virgin islands and um it's what i imagine hawaii was like many years ago uh just low-key uh i showed up in december and all the competitors were outside i just got off the plane and it was a week where it was an astrological kind of uh, anomaly where i think there were seven planets all lined up and you could see them all and you hear the waves um it was it was magical. It was a beautiful spot. It's it's one of my favorite spots to go to. And the great thing about that was that we got down to competition two days later and the first competitor goes out and the engine blows on the boat. Oh my god. <laughs> so then they had a backup boat. An hour later. First skier out, the engine blows on the boat. <laughs> we had no other boats. And we had to wait to find a boat for like three days. So we had to kill like three or four days in the Virgin Islands before we get back to work. Oh, what a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That was a good time. That's a good, that's a good uh, impromptu France, vacation. I did a, I did a month uh, touring France uh, covering the, the Tour de France from start to finish one year. So that might be my number one job. But just for a location, uh, hard to beat the beach. Oh, yeah, that's got to be cool. You get, like, a, a, a detailed view of the whole country. Oh, yeah, day-to-day, day, uh, and it's such a prestigious thing to have the tour of just go through your town, but to be a start town or a finish town 
uh, it's a it's a festival every day and showing off the local foods and local wines. And there's nothing like eating oysters and drinking red wine at seven in the morning. Better than some uh, Vegas buffets, anyway. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you have a celebrity doppelganger or somebody people told you you look like? Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I've had people literally at, at rock concerts turn around and say, Alan Alda. <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> so when he was on MASH, he had dark hair and longer hair. And then I tell people that and they go, oh, yeah. And then other people are like, no, nah, no. Uh, so that's that's the closest. Uh, the, you know, there was probably a sweet spot thirty yeah. years ago where we, that yeah, made we're sense. Both at younger, we both looked. I looked a little older. He looked a little younger. And if you turn the head just right, but no, it's been multiple times. Uh, so that, that would be the only one, I guess. <laughs> Alan Alda. Yeah, he was big. He was big. No, huh? huge, huge. Um, all right. We have a few more questions here, and then I'll let you go. Um, how often do you get to play poker? You know, the, I know you commentate a lot, but you do have some results, and uh, I don't know how, how much of an online grinder you are. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I have I have no uh, real legal avenue to, to play where I am in California online. Um, as far as uh, playing uh nothing right now during the pandemic but uh before uh yeah I, there's a because i have to imagine you know you've picked up some weird hobbies over the years just based on what you've covered oh and yeah i'm wondering if poker is up is up there it is absolutely um it really does help me in my work um understand the game and and understand um actions and 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 see quirks and see people do things that if i see it on tv it's like oh okay i've seen that and why they do that and but just stories to um the kind of people poker people are to bring that kind of make poker players 3d characters rather than just people mm. you know under hats and behind sunglasses and um because that's i think it's a strength of any show um that i think a lot of tv sports getting away from is the making these people who are watching real people. It's very easy to ignore that when it's just, you know, bet, raise, call. Um, they're real people, and that helps people care about them more. But, uh, yeah, I pick up a lot by playing poker. Um, I'm still a cyclist from my years covering cycling and Tour de France. and So, yeah, I guess I'm kind of a chameleon based on what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm I, reading here that you like fly fishing. I'm wondering if you ever covered that. <laughs> Ah, oh, that was a year. I did a year of fishing <laughs> shows. Um, and kind of a funny story because I did some, I was doing a fishing show for uh, ESPN called uh, Subaru American Outback, um, sponsored by Subaru, of course, because that's the name of their vehicle. <laughs> uh, but traveled a lot to some of the really beautiful uh, fly fishing spots. <laughs> And then partway through that gig, I got hired by Fox to do a Fox fishing show. So I was doing two fishing shows for competing networks, and neither one <laughs> well, doing that. I was a time where I needed the gig. I wasn't going to tell them, no, I'm doing a fishing show for ESPN. Uh, the Fox That's show, why you put a non-compete in there. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, the, the Fox show was more of an interview show because we were doing uh, – fishing lakes a lot for bass a lot with uh while interviewing nascar drivers and so every week was a different nascar driver uh and a different spot to fish so it was a lot, it was a lot of fun that man I, every time i think you're done telling me a new gig you had <laughs> <laughs> I know, right <laughs> have, have we have we missed any of the weirder ones oh man i yeah yeah probably yeah. I haven't looked at my resume lately. It's probably on there somewhere. But the one you said uh, earlier about snow shoveling was, I guess, the weirdest. Oh, oh yeah, long forgotten. But yeah, I went to uh, New Mexico uh, for shovel racing, and that's an actual thing. <laughs> of course, it is. Uh, are you superstitious at all? Uh, n not really. 
And if I find myself heading in that direction, I try to get away from it. Um, but I guess there are times, I actually, not so much super, yeah, maybe. It was just a, a person early on in my TV career, um, the, the TV station hired somebody back in the day to do your fashion advice and fashion help and give you some sort yeah. of sense how to dress on TV and, and what colors look best on you and that kind of nice stuff. Um, yeah. And so, um, what color were you? Oh man. I, I think it was an autumn. <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> definitely jackets I had, uh, kind of baby shit, brown jackets. That says, Don't wear that. Don't wear that. Uh, and, uh, but one thing they, they did was talk to you, about your personality and uh so she saw that i was not a real serious person and she said okay so why don't you uh wear either a every time you're on the air really funny socks or really funny underwear that nobody knows and you have this little secret uh in your head that gives you a little twinkle a little snark on your lips (laughs) no you're wearing this crazy stuff that nobody else does so I guess I kind of go for that once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. The underwear or the socks? Um, actually, both. Because <laughs> um, I, I tend to buy a lot of socks uh, for gifts as well. And I had a bunch of socks I was going to give away. And I said, no, I'm going to keep those. And so uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, and I do that. I have my first cash in poker was a final table at a circuit event in Lake Tahoe. And I think I've, there may have been some similar underwear worn day to day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta keep the streak going, right? Yeah, absolutely, uh, well, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. Um, what about you know the rest of your degen behavior? What's the what's the biggest non poker wager you've ever made? Non poker wager? <clears throat> you know, um, I'm I'm not I'm Scottish. Uh, so there's not a lot of money that flows out with that's not carefully managed. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I don't know if it's wagers. It's kind of, you know, maybe a little investing. I've had to give back a house that I bought to flip and couldn't flip it. Uh, hand the deed <laughs> that's a bad gamble. <laughs> yeah, bad gamble. Um, but you know where I'm making a money pit. Yeah, right. Yeah, Tom Hanks and Shelley Long, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, the the I guess the the deepest I've gotten in might be with with golf and golfing with poker players. I make more money off poker players playing golf than I do playing poker. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's not really big, uh, but I I had to pay off a surprisingly uh, good at times Gavin Smith on the golf course. Um, oh, and uh, but still, like uh, poker players come around here to Thunder Valley, and we get together for some uh, golf, and I usually wind up uh, on the plus side. So we'll yeah, see. you got that local knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay, we have a couple more here. Uh, what's the most entertaining thing you've watched, read, or listened to since lockdown? Oh wow. Um, there uh, was a, a great book that I read that um, you read it and it's kind of a Forrest Gump of World War II type book. Um, that oh, nice. Was, it was beautifully written. Um, so the same character weaves his way throughout the whole story? Yeah, and it's, and it's a true story also. Um, and it's called Beneath a Scarlet Sky, and it's about this Italian kid who lives in Milan, and he gets swept up to be um, a spy uh, working in the Nazi army, but he's really uh, spying and giving information as a teenager, and then through his teens in World War II. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautifully written book, uh, and it's a true story. How he just kept me—he met Mussolini several times. He—he he was a driver for a, a Nazi uh, general, and so he got to be inside a lot of things. And 
Uh, it's yeah, so it's wonderful on the book side. Uh, viewing side, I uh, just finished the Queen's Gambit last week, and oh, that yeah. was eye-opening. Uh, the acting in that, and um, just wishing that poker could have done that as well uh, in in a film variety, because they did a lot of things that I wanted to do on the early poker shows with the imagining what was going on in the character's brain while she was deciding what move to make. Very similar to poker players, but we never could really pull it off uh, with the budget we had. So that Come was on, really you're forgetting good. tilt. All right. <laughs> I am. Thank you. I am. <laughs> ESPN's tilt available on Tubi, everyone. <laughs> I don't get paid for it. Shut up. Lon is in the last three episodes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, favorite gambling movie? Uh, gambling movie. I um, does Color of Money count? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any sort of hustle. Hustler, maybe, the hustler, maybe the hustler. Even you know uh, the updated. Uh, I actually got to meet um, the hustler. Uh, what was his name? I can't forget. I can't. Who Paul Newman played? Uh, oh man, I was gonna say Paul Newman. <laughs> yeah, um, but th- that's a real guy, and um, I'm, I apologize to him for not being able to remember his name right now. But I met him because he was a life coach for. Um, oh, of course, Eddie Felson. Eddie Felson, yeah, fast, Eddie. fast Eddie. Oh, he was a he was a life coach for a very prominent poker player for a while, so I got to meet him and hang out with him. And, really? Uh, it was, oh yeah, it was kind of cool. So yeah, those old movies are fun. The the new ones, uh, Casino Royale, I thought did a. It was, I love Bond, so you put Bond and poker together. What's wrong with that? So yeah. Yeah. We end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question I'll never generator. Do a random question. Oh really? Shit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Here it what is. is what is this random thing? What is it? Do you, is it a, do you have a, a big thing of a bingo balls that comes out and spits something out? Or is it a computerized thing? Or are you just I, making it up? I built a very elaborate machine. It's a Rube Goldberg machine. I want noise. Uh, I want sound effects here, okay? I started at the beginning of the podcast, and it usually ends around now <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to give me the, the question. Right. <laughs> it's Perfect. definitely not a website with just a bunch of lists. It's definitely not that. Can All right. I answer before you ask the question. Let's see if it matches. I'm going to answer the question okay. before you before you ask the question. We'll see. And if this, if it matches your question, then we're done and we saved a lot of time. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So uh, I was 12, and her name was Victoria, and uh, we haven't talked since. All right. Here we go. Do you eat food that's past its expiration date yeah. if it still <laughs> smells and looks fine? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, and the reason I do, and I'll even go as far as milk. Um, oh. because, uh, no, again, you're saying it smells and looks fine. Uh, <laughs> I used to manage a 7-Eleven years ago in college. I was a manager at Delhi, and I managed a 7-Eleven store. And the dates are like stop signs. Uh, where they're just a suggestion, right? <laughs> and so they're actually good for, uh, supposed to be good for at least a week afterward. And so if you look at it and it says April 1st, you know, it's good for at least a week and then maybe longer. And if you buy some almond coconut milk like I do once in a while, you got an extra two or three months. So uh, Oof. Sure answer yes. And I will go through the refrigerator and go, hmm, and I'll smell it. I didn't, I didn't uh, know hey, you were so, so they brave. Know, they don't know. What's up? I didn't know you were so brave. You know, uh, how great. Yeah, listen, <laughs> you guys, if you, if you have expired dairy out there, just send it to Lon. He'll take your milk, <laughs> your, your yogurt, <laughs> your cottage cheese. <laughs> Lon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, uh, Julio, it was a pleasure. I, I really appreciate the effort you put into it and uh, your research and your interest because it, uh, it's helping move everything forward and it raises the bar. 
Well, thank you very much. It's easy when you are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. That's it. That is the show. And uh, a big thank you to Lon for coming on and sharing the stories. Honestly, he had so many different things that I wanted to talk about that I didn't even get to ask him about his nephew, Matthew Wood, uh, who is a five-time Academy Award-nominated sound engineer who worked on movies like Wall-E and uh, There Will Be Blood, as well as every Star Wars project since 2005. You can also find Lon on Twitter, at Lon McCarran, and also don't forget to watch him on coverage of the 2020 main event, which is set to begin on February 28th on ESPN2. You can also find us on Twitter, at CardPlayerMedia, and at Poker underscore Stories. If you liked what you heard, go ahead and subscribe for a brand new Poker Stories podcast every two weeks. Also, please do us a favor and leave us a nice review and five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, and let us know you did it with an email to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com, and we'll make sure to hook you up with a free digital subscription to CardPlayer Magazine. Thanks for listening.